Hi everyone, it's me, Fran Drescher, the founder of the Cancer Schmancer Movement, and we are presenting you with this new series called Corona Care For You. I'm very excited with today's guest, Dr. Joseph Mercola. He is one of the main frontline leaders in whole body medicine, functional medicine, integrative medicine, whatever you want to call it. He is at the helm. And uh, I'm just such a big fan of his. I feel so honored and privileged that he is joining us today. I use his vitamins. And I have to thank you, Dr. Mercola, because you put it in glass. And since yeah. I am somebody that's always trying to reduce my plastic intake, I'm just so grateful that you're not only mindful about what you put in the bottle, but the bottle itself. Well, thank you for those kind words, Fran. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Well, I just wanted to, I want to dive right in because obviously uh, the thing that's on the hearts and minds of everybody right now is this coronavirus. And there's a lot of fear and confusion. A lot of people feel helpless and hopeless. And we're here to uh, bring a little bit of clarity and peace of mind. And as we all know, knowledge is power. So uh, something that has been of interest to me and that you have taken note of is that uh, a lot of the people that are suffering the most and being hit the hardest are considered clinically obese. Is that some, do you see a correlation with that? Yes, I do. I can go into that in more detail, but I wanted to address the fear component because I just want people to acknowledge that it's okay to be afraid because that's precisely what the mainstream media has been seeking to achieve. That is their goal. That is their intention to create this massive amount of fear. And if they're successful, don't blame yourself. They did it to you. So, you know, I normally believe it's important to take responsibility for things, but this has been engineered in the media to create massive amounts of fear. Now, are some people dying? Absolutely, but it's totally blown out of proportion. For the last four decades, I've been diligently seeking to understand what optimizes human health. And those same principles that optimize human health in improve your immune system and improves your ability to defeat any infection, not just SARS-CoV-2. So <clears throat> you asked about obesity, and there's no question that obesity is one of the, the comorbidities associated with this, this disease. Now, there are several others. One of the most significant ones is age. So most of the people who are dying from this are elderly. I think in, I don't know what the stats are in the US, but it's at least 60%, and probably closer to 70, maybe even 80%, depending on the community, of the people who are dying are that age. So it's the elderly. Now, unlike the traditional flu, there are younger people dying, but of those younger, pe younger people who are dying, they almost all have these comorbidities. And what is that? That means an associated disease. One of those conditions is obesity. The other would be high blood pressure or hypertension. Another would be diabetes or taking cholesterol medication. And what's the common denominator in all of those symptoms are the fact that they reflect someone who is insulin resistant. And when you are insulin resistant, you lose the ability to become metabolically flexible or to be able to switch seamlessly and transition between burning fat as a primary fuel and burning sugar. Most people, in the country can only burn sugar. And when I say most, how many in the people, what percentage of people in the country are metabolically inflexible or insulin resistant? Um, 80. <laughs> Very good. Very good. It's probably the, 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 the reference I have is 88%. You are really close. And that is pretty pr profound. I mean, that's someone who is essentially pre-diabetic, 88%. Essentially, and those stats are from four years old now. There's nothing even more current. That was NHANES data in the last year they looked at was 2016. So it's probably closer to 90%. And that's just profound. So nine out of 10 people in the United States are at risk for developing a complication of disease. And if you're one of the one in 10 who aren't, you're almost bulletproof and will not die from this disease. 
See, that's, you know, because there's such a uh, wide range of the way people are being impacted by this virus from mm -hmm. being completely asymptomatic, even if they test positive, to having a full-blown reaction that puts their life in jeopardy and sometimes costs them their life. And it seems more and more apparent after speaking with doctors like yourself that the way we live is not preparing us for the eventuality of a pandemic well a, an exposure to an infectious agent whether it's naturally occurring or engineered in some lab uh, or manipulated by people to become more infectious which there is strong evidence to support and suggest that this was what happened with this virus because <clears throat> normal virus, viruses or infectious agents in, in the community are not as challenging, but this one's been changed in a way to make it particularly problematic. But even so, when you upregulate, improve, and optimize your immune system, you can defeat it and easily do that. So the, we'll talk about how you can become metabolically flexible in a moment, but there's two other com elements to this that I'd like to address. And one that's not really related to metabolic flexibility, but just about as important. And the nice thing about it is that for many people, it's something you can change for free, for free. And that is the amount of circulating vitamin D in your blood. And the way you can do this for free is that you can basically, this is, we're coming into summer now for many people. I live in Florida and it's been summer here for two months now, essentially. So all I have to do is go outside when it's sunny and solar noon and solar noon in, in, in the daylight savings time is one o'clock. It's not 12. Um, that's when the sun's at its peak. And then you go around that time and uh, you just put, you get ex the sun exposed on a significant portion of your skin. So if you're a woman, you're in sports bra and shorts. And if you're a man, you take off your shirt and shorts. And you get enough sun exposure so that you don't get burnt and you get the slightest amount of pain and that will give you more than enough vitamin D to make for that day. You do that regularly and you can optimize your vitamin D levels. Um, I haven't swallowed vitamin D for over a decade and my level is over 70. Ideally, your you level- know, I was just on the phone with my parents, doctor, because they were afraid to leave the house. Yeah, and yeah, they yeah. are taking high levels of vitamin D, but I keep telling them just, you, I gave them the N95 mask, just go sit in front of the house. Yeah, 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 but they got they got to sit with their shirt off. Uh, if are they, where are they in in, the, in New York? They're or? in South Florida. Oh, South Florida, oh, perfect. Then they're set. They're totally set. They don't need to do anything else. Now, not everyone has the luxury of living in Florida, Southern California, or Arizona, and uh, may or may well. Now most people aren't working; they're stuck at home. But you can go outside, and you, and you have to take your shirt off. But typically, when people are working, they're in their office, and they're, they're just not able to get outside. So, for whatever reason, you are unable to get sun exposure. Then you can swallow vitamin D. The danger is you don't know what the dose is. It's probably going to be at least two thousand units a day, but it could be as high as ten thousand units a day or more. And the only way you know is to measure your blood level. Just like high blood pressure, you cannot know what your vitamin D level is without measuring it. And the test you can, you don't even need a doctor's order. You can get them online. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive and you can figure it out. And once you have your level, you know how much you need to supplement with. And it's something I strongly recommend everything to do. So, so that is an essential you component. Is a saliva of test or something that you can do it at home? No, it's a, it's, a, it's a blood test, a serum test. And typically it's a pin prick on a f your finger and you put it on a blotter, piece of blotter paper and you mail it in. Now, there was an interesting study published last, no, this month actually, that reviewed 212 patients with COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. Of those 212 patients, they looked at the, pe the pe individuals who had the least severe form of it, the most mild symptoms. And of those individuals, 94% of them had normal vitamin D levels, 94%. And then they looked at another group, the ones who had severe or were critical. And of that group, only 4% had normal vitamin D levels. Now that's not a causal association, but it's pretty compelling evidence to suggest that vitamin D might have something to do with your ability to resist this illness. So it is just crazy insane not to optimize your vitamin D levels. And it's, it's kind of negligent. I mean, it's so simple to do. And even if you're taking the supplement, which you don't have to do, it's pretty inexpensive. You know, it's one of the least expensive supplements you can take on the market. I mean, it's 
almost free. Um, and uh, so do that. And then, you know, to move, to get out and move. I and mean, if you're, even if you're stuck at home, you can still do exercise at home. And there's, you know, we've got, I'm not a big fan of Google. And Google has censored me uh, and many other natural health websites for about a year now and, and censored me on YouTube. And I've been censored on mainstream media. So people may not see me on TV as much because I've been blacklisted on TV now for I don't know, five, six, seven years. And I want just to want to put that into context. Over 80% of ad dollars from national television shows come from Big Pharma. And when yeah, yeah. somebody like Mercola is saying food is medicine, and by the way, <laughs> it's a lot cheaper, uh, you know, then you, there's going to be dictating from, you know, uh, the man upstairs to not have him be heard because it goes against uh, big pharma and what they live for, which is to keep you hooked yeah. on drugs. Yeah, it's it's not aligned with their their business interests, so it's definitely a conflict, and that's pro but I suspect one of the primary reasons why I'm not there, which is fine. I mean, we get our message out, but you're not going to find me on Google, and it's sad. It's the biggest reason that concerns me is that there are so many people now who need to understand what the truth is and what they believe that they've been led to believe because they've been conditioned over the last 20 years that most of the information is available and non-censored on Google. And that changed last year. They said they are massively censoring. And instead of putting up sites, when you put in information, because we, we came up number one in the search and for hundreds if not thousands of different words we would be the first because we've been out there for over 20 years we, our start cited before google did and instead of our site now or others that provide similar information you will find only three websites what are those websites webmd healthline today and medical news or health and help online and medical news today i think are the three and what's the common denominator between all those three sites, they're all owned by ad, owned by ad agencies, which are essentially advertised on Google. And when you pull up the information on the keyword you're searched for, like, like on gout or arthritis, you will find an article that advertises drugs in that article, which is an absolute violation of the, of the rules and we literally could put, throw them in jail, but they don't, they're not prosecuted for it. So, they're violating, because you cannot do that with a supplement. If you're making a claim and talk, talk to an article about gout and you talk about a supplement, you can go to jail. But you can, it's okay to do it if it's a drug and if you're a drug company. So they, they bypass, they got, I don't know what massive loopholes they're going to over. Just, so I, I think that the audience just has to realize that, and we keep yeah. saying this over and over again, just try and be savvy because all roads lead to Rome and the systemic malignancy with all the woes of the world is greed. So, you know, you know, use your noodle and don't be so trusting because a lot, everything seems to be about the bottom line at the expense of everything of true value. So that this is what we have to change. I want to ask you, uh, Dr. Mercola, um, what are your thoughts on ozone and how in general, as a therapeutic and how it pertains to uh, the coronavirus? Well, the last three months, I've really been focusing and concentrating on this, this epidemic and some of the strategies one can use to optimize it. So I've really been going deep. Every week, I'm interviewing one of the leaders in the natural health fields for this. And I interviewed Robert Rowan about ozone therapy. He clearly is one of the top guys in the country. And I've interviewed him many times before. I think the last time prior to that was when he went to Sierra Leone to treat Ebola successfully. Uh, and uh, we interviewed him about this, and it works really well. I mean, his, his oxidative therapy is clearly one strategy. It may be more expensive or less convenient for many people to get. Another oxidative strategy that he introduced me to, and I further confirmed with Thomas Levy, who's another person I interviewed about intravenous vitamin C, along with Dr. Andrew Saul, um, was nebulized hydrogen peroxide. And I did a video on that, which of course was banned and censored by YouTube. And I got great publicity in the UK. I mean, they were calling me all sorts of names over there for trying to, to make people believe I was, I was like a quack or doing something to scam them when I wasn't selling anything. I, I was, you just use simple peroxide and nebulizer, neither of which I sell. 
And I, I did a 20 minute video, it goes into the history. You can find this video on my site. It's on BitChute. BitChute is the alternative to YouTube that will not censor anything. And essentially- Can you explain to our audience what nebulizing- uh, Sure. The nebulizing part- is, a, is, there's a number of devices that essentially convert the liquid that you put in there, in this case, hydrogen peroxide, into little particles that you inhale, usually through a mask. You can do it through a mouthpiece, but a mask would be better. And you have to be really careful that you use food grade hydrogen peroxide because the regular peroxide you get at the grocery store for a dollar has stabilizers in it. Those can be somewhat problematic. And typically, you don't even want to use the 3%. You're so using very dilute versions. Typically, you would put it down to uh, like five cc's or a teaspoon in like three ounces of water. So it's pretty dilute. Uh, you know, you would, and then you would just take a maybe a half a teaspoon of that and nebulize it. And uh, the water, of course, should be clean and probably add a, maybe half a teaspoon of salt to it to make it closer to normal saline. And uh, that seems to be really, really effective. There's a number of clinicians like Dr. Frank Schallenberger, who's been using this for two decades effectively, and essentially almost all his patients who use this do not get flu. But done early on, it can be really effective. And it's a simple strategy. So that's an alternative to ozone. If you, and, and, and a therapy that's even more effective than ozone, uh, and ozone is more effective than intravenous hydrogen pro, uh, yeah, intravenous vitamin C, which actually people don't know it, but vitamin C, of course, has been used a lot for this illness, and orally and intravenously. Orally, in small doses, it's a it's a it's a nutrient that is uh, required to as a cofactor in in many metabolic uh, interactions, but at high doses, higher doses, it's really a drug. It's a safe drug. It actually breaks down to peroxide, which is another oxidative agent. So you could take intravenous vitamin C and it will work, or you can take intravenous peroxide, or you can t- do nebulized peroxide, and they all seem to be pretty effective. Um, and is an alt- the the really the top of the mo- the top of the mountain and the best therapy for critically ill individuals. Uh, and I've known this for a long time, but just re- just within the last week, we've seen the first published report in this is hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, there is a uh, center down in Louisiana who's been exclusively using this as an alternative to ventilators, and they have a 100% success rate. No one has died who's going on hyperbaric, which is in stark contrast to those who are going on ventilators in most scenarios, and it's about 80 to 90% death rate once you're put on the ventilator. So is so, that when you go into the chamber? Yes, it's a chamber. It's a hard shell chamber, typically acrylic. These, um, there's a number of manufacturers. The main one is Seacrest. And then they have liquid oxygen that goes in. It's 100% oxygen and you usually go to two, two to three atmospheres or so. And you stay in there for about an hour. And there's this, they have a process where you have to decontaminate between patients, but it seems to be really effective. And they don't need a, a large number of treatments, typically a handful of treatments and they're better. Yeah, so it's pretty wow, incredible. That's very interesting. Yeah, are yeah. we at a stage now where hospitals are actually able to try things like this without? Well, some progressive hospitals are. Uh, it depends on who's on their staff. Now, this hospital in Louisiana, they had a pretty progressive staff there, and they actually had a hyperbaric chamber is integrated in part of the hospital. They had six chambers, and so they were open to it. They were familiar with it. it almost a 30 year experience with, and they knew how effective it was. So they said, why not, why don't we use it for this? And they did. And, you know, Do you they, have they, an opinion about the plasma uh, therapy that uh, is being experimented with now? With- yeah, we've done, we've done an article on that and I think it may be effective. It's just a temporary measure. It's passive antibodies that they're extracting from people who've been exposed to it. I don't, not a big fan of it because it's, it's, it may work, but I think there's a lot of complications to it, and it's not as simple or as, as ba- foundational as the therapies I just described. I mean, the, I mean, for mild cases, the, the nebulized peroxide literally is going to cost you pennies, pennies. I mean, it's less than five cents, probably less than a penny. Once you have the equipment, I mean, you could treat your whole neighborhood for under a dollar, you know, effective, maybe probably under a quarter. <laughs> you know, it's pretty inexpensive. Um, so. And there's like virtually no toxicity. There's no known side effects. I mean, there's basically no downside. So I, I like those types of therapies that are you know less complicated and, and really tend to treat just. The, yeah, and uh, they tend now, to be the ones we don't hear about because they'd rather yeah. 
everybody be chomping at the bit for the vaccine that doesn't exist? Well, it will exist. That's a sad, sad reality. Is uh, the uh, the uh, actually the vaccine is in human clinical trials since last month, and uh, the evidence suggests that they will be offering it probably this year in the fall, which is insane. It's going to be a disaster on steroids. There are so many people who are going to get sick and die from this vaccine. It's, there is it has never been adequately safe tested. Every single coronavirus has. There's never been an effective vaccine for a coronavirus. And right, that's leading, why I'm surprised. Do you think yeah. this one is going to get through? No, it's not. Not just me. What do I know? I'm not a virologist, but the leading coronavirus researcher in the United States, if not the world, is Dr. Ralph Merrick out of the University of North Carolina. And he would definitively said that the coronavirus vaccine will not work for the elderly. But why listen to him? What does he know, you know? <laughs> so, you know, but Gates has it on his brain that, the, you know, the the – the world's not going to be back to normal until every person in the, the world gets vaccinated against this vaccine. And you just do not want this vaccine. That's the last thing in the world. It will definitely harm you. You just have to look back to 77 with the, the swine flu vaccine, which, which was implemented even though no one died from the swine flu. And they knew that. Yet they still put all this money into making this vaccine. Well, we'll give it to people. And they, they killed and harmed over 600 people damage and the government had to wind, wind up compensating for it. and getting brave was a complication of that so and that was swine flu that's nothing like coronavirus so and and they the the, the, the vaccine safety trials they have done on animals with, with coronaviruses i just give you an example they gave, gave it to ferrets that, and the vaccine worked tremendously they got great antibody responses their humoral system responded really well but then when they exposed them to the coronavirus they all died they all died so they're not even doing animals tests. They're just giving humans human trials and it's, and it's going to launch this thing probably before they even have a chance to look at how it affects the humans they tested it on for more than a few weeks, more than likely, before they put it into production. So it's beyond crazy, but it's not surprising. The single best way and strategy I know, and I've written books on this actually, and my book, Fat for a Fuel, is one of the best books I've written. Uh, and it discusses this in great detail. So would you, I bet you would like to know, for the 90% of people who are not metabolically flexible, what's the simple, best, and least costly way to become metabolically flexible? Would you like to know the answer to that? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, it doesn't cost anything because the only thing, the, the, not the only thing, but the primary most effective way to achieve this is to compress your eating window. So 90% of the people are eating more than 12 hours a day. And many of those are eating 16 hours a day or more. So that means they're eating from the moment they get up to the time to go to bed. And some of those people are waking up in the middle of the night and eating. That is a prescription for metabolic disaster because your blood, sugar's your blood sugar stores never become depleted so you always have this surplus of, glu of glucose from uh, available from the food that you ate circulating, which then doesn't trigger your body to machinery to have the capacity to burn the fat that you have stored. So, and you can do that occasionally, and you should do that occasionally where you're, 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 you're eating more than restricted time with but when you do it consistently you will become metabolically flexible and you have insulin resistance and then you'll get the complications of obesity high blood pressure diabetes well this is really state-of-the-art stuff and most definitely the future and you happen to just mention in what you were just saying about how you know if insurance isn't going to cover and that unfortunately is another catch-22 mm -hmm. because insurance should be supporting doctors like yourself who are all about um, health care and not about sick care. Uh, but we're in this terribly negative revolving door about how, keeping people chronically ill while living longer. It's not negative, it's actually suppressive because it, the uh, conventional authorities will look, find you out and threaten to reprimand or, or, or remove your license for implementing some of these practices because it's not state of uh, standard of care, not considered standard of care. Yeah, which makes it prohibitive for any fresh new thinking to yeah. emerge. It's a challenge, no question. But you know, ultimately when you see these 
responses that conventional therapies have to even at simp relatively simple infectious challenges like we've had with this pandemic. You can, you can see it's just a miserable failure. They have no solution other than supportive. And you know, even their solutions putting my people with ventilators is killing them. And they don't, they don't know what to do. And then when you look at natural therapies, it's like a, a, almost 100% cure rate. Even despite the fact that it's still a Band-Aid because the things that they're doing, the, the ozone therapies and hyperbaric dimensions, those are not treating the foundational cause. They're very effective Band-Aids that work, but still you've got to address the cause, which is that metabolic inflexibility and that insulin resistance if you really want to fix this thing. Exactly right. Exactly right. And that's what they're not talking. That's not the conversation at all no, no, on it's, national broadcasts. No, it's an, it, 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 because the pandemic, the pandemic is insulin resistance. It is not this infection. It is not. The pandemic is insulin resistance, but very few clinicians understand that. Very few. Well, you know, you never disappoint, Dr. Mercola. You're just amazing. And uh, I have one other question for you, and I'm glad I, um, I didn't forget to ask you. But um, do you see? I, I, I do. You, I know that you know your position on um, EMF and 5G, and uh, um, do you think that the introduction of 5G into communities has exacerbated this or been the culprit? Uh, as you know, I wrote a book on it. It's called EMF. Um, it was a popular book. Probably is, you know, I humbly assert that it's the best book written on this topic at this point. So maybe someone will come wrong, write a better one. But it, it so I've studied it really carefully. It took me three years to write this. And uh, I'm a firm believer that it is something you want to limit your exposure to and that it can cause challenges to your immune system. But I don't believe this is the big issue with this at all. I think there's, there's other variables. I think the media is probably more of an issue than 5G. So I don't, uh, it doesn't help, put it that way, but it really hasn't been deployed that much, especially since it started last year. Now, it's been deployed in some communities, but really hasn't been widely adopted. And there's speculations, yes, but Wuhan was a 5G center and other, like the Diamond Princess had all this 5G. And so it, it didn't help. Could it have been a factor? Probably, but we don't know. I mean, it's never been, we haven't even studied 3G. The National Toxicology Program was the biggest study. It was $25 million funded by the National Institutes of Health, showed that 2G, 2G causes cancer. They haven't even looked at 3G, 4G, let alone 5G. They won't even look at 5G for 20 or 30 more years. You know, it just takes a long time for them to get the funding to do these trials and then to implement it and to study it. So it, it's literally a 10-year process. Well, thank you for clarifying that as well. And that EMF is an amazing book, and I encourage everybody to get it. And also, you know, go to Mercola.com. Everybody at home, thank you so much for tuning in to Corona Care for You. Keep checking in with us as we continue to post fascinating interviews with real trailblazers like Dr. Mercola. And we wish all of you good health and long life as well. Peace. Hi everyone, it's me, Fran Drescher. Well, I hope you enjoyed Corona Care for You. And if you did, please think about making a donation to us at cancerschmancer.org slash donate. Like so many nonprofits, we've had to cancel all of our fundraising events. So it's really up to you to help keep us going. We depend on your donations, your support, and your love. There is no donation that's too small, and we are grateful to anything that you feel comfortable giving. And continue to come in to the Cancer Schmanza Corona Care For You series because we are constantly posting new content, and we hope that it's helpful to you and your family. Don't forget to donate. We really appreciate your support. Thank you.